Hi, my name is Kimberly McQuarrie, and I'm the Director of Community Programming here at the Delhi Museum. Tonight, we're happy to invite you to join us for our first ever virtual panel discussion at the Dali. Tonight's discussion was inspired by the convergence of two events, the launch of a new exhibit at the museum and Hispanic Heritage Month, both of which invite us to think deeply about culture and identity, specifically the role culture and all of its complexity plays in shaping us. First, our exhibit, Diego and Frida, A Visual History, chronicles two artists who made a career of grappling with issues of identity, delving deeply into Mexico's past and present to explore issues of race, ethnicity, gender, and class. Rivera essentially created a new iconography for Mexican national identity in his murals, while Frida created a new personal iconography, especially through her self-portraits of her own complex identity. Frida actually once famously said, I am a mixture, referring to her mother who was of indigenous and Spanish descent and her father, a German who emigrated to Mexico. Both artists bring to mind the concept forwarded by feminist writer, Adrian Rich of the politics of location where identity begins with the geography that is the closest in, which is the body and then considers how that body is located in physical space and history and sits at the intersection of multiple identities. And that really brings us to our second event, which is Hispanic Heritage Month. This annual celebration was started to celebrate the history, cultural and accomplishments of US Hispanic communities. And as a celebration of Hispanic heritage for people now living in the US, it complicates even more that idea of a politics of location. When thinking about people who are living in the diaspora, maybe we'd be more apt to say, is it a politics of dislocation? That is, how do we find our identity when we're dislocated from the place that has heretofore identified us? Now, in order to dig more deeply into these questions, we're really pleased to partner tonight with SPIFS the St. Petersburg International Folk Fair Society to hold this conversation. Founded in 1975, SPIFS is the only independent multi-ethnic organization of its kind in the United States. And as a fellow organization dedicated to promoting a diversity of voices and viewpoints, we're happy to jointly sponsor tonight's discussion. Now I'd like to introduce my co-host for tonight's discussion, Fred Johnson, and he's going to kick us off with some opening remarks. Thank you so much, Kim. It's really an honor to be able to be a part of this evening's panel discussion. When we first started to talk with you and the folks at the Dali Museum about the opportunity to really be able to collaborate around conversations of culture and celebrating culture, we just immediately understood that there was a, a, an amazing link for over 46, this would be the 46th year that the folk fair would be presented in, uh, in St. Petersburg. Spiffs has really been there to invite people to learn about, to celebrate, to really come together, to have conversations and laughter and really discover that it's the things that are different about us that make the human experience magnificent. At last year's folk fair, over 48 presenters from ethnic cultures and ethnic communities from around the world had the opportunity to say, here we are and here's a little of, of what we're about. I still have conversations with my children and now my grandchildren about those experiences and how they really kind of set the form and shape for beginning to understand that there are so many people out there in the world. And so we, in, in harmony with the Dali Museum, love this opportunity to really be able to come together and celebrate and learn about and talk about the vastness of our cultural experiences on an everyday basis. You know, once a year, the, uh, the St. Petersburg International Folk Fair the Society has, has been known for their, for their fairs, but we recognize that every single day is a day to celebrate the richness of who we are. And so we're happy to be a part of this experience. And so our journey begins this evening uh, by talking about the relevance of that and, and really kind of digging into how do each one of us do that in our lives. So I'd love to start off by 
giving everybody the opportunity to introduce themselves. And so we'll start first with Denise. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Denise de Leon. I am the school programs manager here at the Dali Museum. I am originally from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, I have had a kind of a long winding road to get to where I am today. Um, I was born in Puerto Rico. I lived there till I was around three years old. Um, then my family moved to the States. Um, we lived in Orlando for a few years, then lived in North Carolina in Charlotte. And then we moved back to Puerto Rico um, and I did middle school and high school there. Um, I always dreamed about coming back to the States to go to college. So I ended up going to school in Virginia and lived there for a few years after graduating. And then life brought me to Tampa Bay, to Florida and to the Dali Museum. And I've been here for about four years. Um, so that's kind of me in a nutshell and how I've gotten to, to where I am today. Thank you, Denise. Jennifer? Absolutely. Hello, everybody. My name is Jenny Gonzalez Bonert. I'm the membership manager here at the Dali. I've been here for a little bit over uh, nine months. I'm originally from Mexico City. Uh, my mother is from New York. My father is from Mexico City. They met while she was studying anthropology, and we reside there until I was 10 years old. She wanted to give both my sister and I the opportunity to see both worlds. Uh, so we moved to Citrus County. So from Mexico City to Citrus County was quite a culture shock. Uh, but all the gringas were wanting to stay here in the States and or we wanted to go back, actually. And my father was the one that said, no, we've made it this far. We're going to stay here. So I have been blessed to be truly the American dream. Um, I've worked in performing arts centers for 15 years, and I am blessed to be in museums since my degree is in art history. So I feel that the stars have aligned, and I'm ecstatic to be here at the Dali and in this conversation. Good, thanks, Jennifer. Sheena? Hi, thank you everyone for watching and for our beautiful panel. Um, my name is Sheena Abbott, and I'm the Interim Associate Director of SPIFS. Um, I've been a part of the board for a few years now and, and in this position for several months. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm happy to be working with SPIFS. I am actually born and raised here in St. Petersburg. So, um, you know, my, my family, both my mother and my father's side, all immigrated here from different parts of the world. Um, but yeah, born and raised here in St. Petersburg. So I've kind of seen the, um, seen it evolve over the years. Um, you know, and I've lived in all parts of the town and, um, you know, very, very immersed in each community. So, um, you know, I'm thrilled that to work with SPIFS. I'm thrilled that it exists. And, you know, SPIFS, we have all kinds of people from all walks of life who speak all different languages. And so um, I'm just thrilled to be here with you all. Thank you, Shana. Thank you so much. Lota? Hi, I'm Lota Bauman. Uh, just recently retired executive director of SPIFS, came to Florida via Hong Kong and then um, Wisconsin. Been working with SPIFS this last time for eight years and before that in the 90s or 80s even starting. So I've been around for a while and I just love SPIFS. I've been eating, living, dreaming SPIFS, I guess, all these years. And I think it's the most wonderful organization that we can have because it's more important right now than ever that we talk to each other, that we get together, talk about our heritage, our culture, and talk to each other, not just look at each other, get to know each other. And uh, I'll be continuing to do that for as long as I can. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Lota. And Zach? Hello, my name is Latko. I go by Zach Knezewicz. Uh, I'm... Uh, I'm on the board of uh, SPIS, been on the board for a few years. I was president for a couple of terms as well. Um, I was born in former Yugoslavia, specifically Republic of Bosnia, what is now the uh, country of Bosnia. Uh, when the war started in the early 90s, I, uh, me and my family uh, escaped uh, as refugees and we lived in, uh, we found shelter in, in what is now Serbia uh, for almost three years. And then uh, we arrived here. Uh, we, we received an asylum here in the in mid 90s um, and arrived to St. Petersburg, Florida and been here for 25 years. Uh, and that is how the first time I actually uh, came across SPIFS was uh, during uh, one of the field trips for 
folk beer. I thought it was an amazing thing coming from a civil war country, you know, <laughs> where people were not tolerating too many differences at that time. Um, but from a very ethnically diverse background, because if you look at the Balkans, we do have dozens of different ethnic groups living there. So I saw Spiffs as a more peaceful version of the time. And uh, eventually I worked with my group, Serbian group here, and uh, got more and more involved with Spiffs. And eventually uh, somehow I got volunteered on the board and I've been there ever since. And uh, I think it's a wonderful organization. And uh, especially Tampa Bay Area is a wonderful place to be at because of the diversity of cultures that we do have here. It's just, I think, a treasure that we need to maintain and expand. Very good. Thank you so much, Zach. And we're so happy that you're here and all the hard work that you do with SPIS. Thank you. So good. So that gives kind of an overview of, uh, of, of who we all are. I, I will say that for myself personally, it's an interesting journey to not really uh, have a, the opportunity to know where your lineage began which is one of the realities that exists uh, in America, ex especially for Americans of African descent who didn't migrate here on their own, but you know, um, had ancestors who came here by, by virtue of the fact that they were brought here as slaves. So that's an interesting thing that we'll talk a little bit more when we talk about the diaspora, but that's a great overview for all of us. And Kim, I'll turn it over to you to ask our first question. Excellent. And, um... To add on to uh, what I said earlier, obviously I'm the director of community programming here at the Dali, uh, but as a personal connection, um, since everyone else shared something a little bit personal, even though I was born and raised in the United States, um, I've lived for about a decade out of the country um, in Venezuela, which is my husband's home country. And so I have become um, an adopted Venezuelan, wife of a Venezuelan, and mother of um, three Venezuelan-American children. So that's my own uh, personal uh, connection to tonight's conversation. Now, I want to start out with uh, what seems like a really simple question, but as we know, there's no simple questions. Um, why don't we start out with the what question? So what are all the ways that you keep in touch with your cultural heritage, despite the fact that you're no longer living in your home country? And maybe we can kind of start backwards. Why don't we start with uh, Zach? Oh, thanks a lot. Not everybody <laughs> got the copy from my answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this may be a long answer if I really go into every way. Uh, I love technology, but I also love papers and I love books. And fortunately, we live in the times when, it, when it, it is much easier to maintain contact with your home ethnic group, if we can say it that way, than, than it was even 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, I can order books, and I do order books from, from various bookstores that they deliver here. I can order from sellers directly from Serbia or Bosnia or, you know, from Yugoslavia that may have something that interests me. Um, I subscribe to TV programming over there. So I have access to a couple dozen channels that I do watch, you know, right before sleep, I watch their morning programs and I watch their morning news. So I know what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, I also follow internet very closely. I stay in touch with the family and again, with the technology, with, with all the brand names, you know, social media, Instagram, Facebook, Skype, Telegram, my birth, did I forget anybody? I am able to actually stay in touch with my family and, and maintain that connection to my culture and to their celebrations and important days and, day and happenings in their life. And also we do have a fairly large community here uh, of, of Serbian Americans uh, because this Tampa Bay was one of the area where uh, a lot of the refugees were helped to be uh, brought to in a way and uh so we have two churches we have regular happenings events at, uh, at those those community uh places so i am able to really stay in touch with, with some of the happenings but regarding my thing excellent um lota well zach you're right i'm gonna copy a lot of what you said <laughs> the I internet 
Uh, you know, when I left Sweden a long time ago, 1969, I went to Hong Kong and we said, we're not going to call unless an absolute emergency. That's a difference from, you know, not too long, too many years. Today, this I have contacts at least three, four, five, six times a week with my sisters in Sweden via FaceTime or text messaging. I listen to Swedish radio daily. I watch Swedish television. And we don't have a uh, very large active Swedish community here anymore, but we used to have, and I used to be in charge of that, we had all ob- observed all Swedish um, holidays, our midsummer celebrations and everything else. And I still do with a small group of people, but it's really important to me to stay in touch with my heritage. And you know, the thing is what we say is that we say that in my case, you become more Swedish the longer you stay away from Sweden. And it's really true. You know, when I go to Sweden, uh, I seem to know a lot more about certain traditions than my friends in Sweden. And also, they're also so surprised that I speak Swedish so well. And I keep saying, it's my mother tongue, why wouldn't I? But then you hear about people like um, one famous Swede, Dolph Lundgren, he uh, is a big movie star. He came to Sweden after he had been in this country for like five or ten years or something. He refused to speak Swedish because he he didn't speak Swedish anymore, he thought. And that really backfired on him. So he had to apologize many times. But that's a very important. The language is very important to keep in touch. And also not just for you, but for your children and anybody around you that's of the um, of your Swedish or whatever background you happen to be. So that's the most important thing. Keep in touch and keep sp- speaking your language. Excellent. Thank you so much. Jenny? So obviously, um, I have a 12-year-old daughter, so cooking is extremely important to me, and that keeps the tradition alive. So in our home, we're constantly cooking all of our dishes from mis abuelitas, my aunts, my father, my mother. So we're constantly, then I'm passing those recipes down to my daughter, and that's how we keep our tradition alive. Uh, We just celebrated Mexico's Independence Day, so we all do that and keep doing all the traditional celebrations getting ready for a day of the dead celebration and putting our ofrenda up. So passing the traditions to my daughter and keeping that alive. I love music. So I'm constantly listening to Luis Miguel throughout the whole house. And, you know, my daughter knows every single song. So it's a beautiful thing. So that brings you your identity, right? So, and it's a language and surrounding yourselves and being part of the Hispanic chamber, just because in that way you're part and you're keeping your culture alive. So those are the things that I love to do, but it's all about cooking and passing down traditions and keeping that identity of who you are alive and passing it on. Denise? Um, So uh, touching on some of the points that all of you have made, um, Facebook honestly came out right when I started college which I'm dating myself here. Um, And and so most of my high school friends are are still on Facebook. And so being able to keep in touch with them, and most of them are still on the island, um, and being able to kind of sort of live through, um, you know, what they're living through on the island via social media has been a really powerful tool for staying connected, Um, especially considering um, we are, you know, a few days shy or past rather the anniversary of Hurricane Maria, which was a huge moment in um, recent Puerto Rican history. Um, so that's definitely been a touch point. Um, and then of course, music and language as uh, Jenny and Lada have both said, um, living in the States when I was very young and then moving back to Puerto Rico, my parents had a rule that the minute I either set foot in the car or set foot in the house, I had to speak in Spanish. And if I spoke in English, my mom would straight up ignore me. Um, And I'm so grateful, you know, back when I was seven or eight, that was super annoying. Um, But I was so grateful that they really stuck to their guns on that. Um, Because then when we moved back to Puerto Rico, I 
already had that kind of connection to to my country. Um, so I w- and I'm eternally grateful now as an adult to be bilingual and speak both languages. Um, music is a huge source of connection for me, especially Christmas music from Puerto Rico. It's just this special type of music that um, just makes you want to stand up and move your hips and and dance and celebrate. And uh, I won't lie, sometimes I listen to it in the middle of the year if I need a little pick-me-up. Um, but my mom is also a huge uh, music lover. So I grew up listening to music in Spanish as we drove to school um, in North Carolina. So I was the only little girl getting dropped off with Spanish music blaring in the car. Um, but those are all such fond memories that I'm so, so grateful for. And now I'm the mom who's dropping off her son with Spanish music blaring in the car. So it feels very full circle. Excellent. Thank you. Sheena? Yeah. So, you know, my family really instilled, you know, the importance and beauty, you know, in other cultures and traditions and art, music, food, you know, to me at a young age um, and to be proud of my heritage, you know, to make music a part of my life, all kinds Um, And as I shared with Fred one day, I actually became a DJ at one point for several years. And, you know, I went into, you know, different communities and, you know, learned, you know, the the, the music that they loved and the music that they, you know, wanted to hear and things like that. Um, But anyways, and just to be kind and loving to to others as we are all one, um, you know, and I carry that throughout my life. And, you know, with my friends, taste in music, food, and the way I connect with people is a reflection of that. My stepmother, who I grew up with as well, is from Russia, and she immigrated here when she was 30 years old. She didn't have any money, and, um, you know, she kind of suppressed her culture, and she just felt the pressure to, you know, become Americanized, and um, anyways, I connected with her and her culture and and her, um, you know, traditions and ways of living, and her family, um, my fiance, his, he's Mexican American and his mother's, um, you know, traditional Mexican. And, you know, we see her every single week and, you know, we're always cooking. So I think, um, like you all shared just through cooking and things that we all share music and, and, you know, a love of, a love of art and things like that. That's how I connect with, um, you know, my family, you know, my friends and, and, um, people by the backgrounds. Thank you. Now, I know uh, I I now have one question, of course, inspires me to think about 20 more now that I'm interested in asking, but I'm going to let Fred uh, go first because I'm sure he has uh, some follow-up questions for you. Yeah, and I want to say one thing, too. I think it's really interesting, the phenomena, like, you know, I'm proud to be an American. I'm an American. And, you know, in in that tapestry of the world, uh, America is an integral part. And so, you know, um, you know, when you talk about when you talk about music, anybody that knows me, music is a big part of my, my life. And so if you take a look at the palette of American music and in many ways, um, if you take a look at that history of American music, there are many, many, many threads from other countries that become an integral part of that. There was a time. Uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s, so maybe through the 60s and the 70s, where um, on any one American radio station, you would hear all styles of music. You know, you would you would hear music from different styles and, you know, you'd hear classical music, you'd hear jazz, you'd hear pop, you'd hear R&B. So the American tapestry is an amazing tapestry as well. In addition to that, some of us, like, uh, as I mentioned early, earlier, you know, my journey is to find out where are the threads of my past? Where do my ancestors come from? Because that's an important when you don't know, you know, you can't, my, I had a, a, my dad used to say, you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. So those of us who have experiences where we want to know more about our heritage, you know, so I've delved into a lot of African history, history of the African continent and music of the African continent, books and poetry from the African continent to really try to learn those cultures and learn about those language to help sort of fill out this great sort of journey of immigration, if you will, or coming from other places, coming to America. And and so that's an important part of the journey as well. Um, You know, it's interesting to me 
I guess this question, follow-up question is, is kind of for all of you. And that is um, the technology piece is really interesting. You know, like you talked to Lota about, you know, leaving home and saying, yeah, I'm not going to call unless there's an emergency. And now, you know, we are using these various forms of, of technology. Has it, has it changed or do you think do you think it's changed not just that it's created a greater link but has it changed how we know or or, or have our relationship with those with our countries our, our mother countries has there been a shift in terms of what things are important or how you've experienced that your countries are known now uh, i would like to say that i feel more connected with my family in Sweden than I ever did before mm. because for so many years that I I couldn't talk to them or write letters but it's not the same thing especially now we, we have FaceTime we can look at each other we have Zoom or whatever so I have three younger sisters in Sweden and I really the youngest ones when I came to this country, I almost didn't know them because I've been gone so long. But now I feel much more, much more close to them. And mm. my, my older, you know, older relatives too, I keep in touch with them too. I have a, an aunt who's 92. I call her all the time. And so I keep connected in the way that I couldn't do before. So the technology has really made a big difference in my life. Mm. That's great. It's really interesting to hear almost each and every one of you almost immediately went to the concept of family, which I think is really great. I mean, you know, there's so much conversation in our world about, you know, conflicts and things. But the one thing that like in this collective group is that family is really important and that, you know, we've connected to family or you're able to communicate with your family or you're sharing something with your family or learning something from your family. So it feels to me that that's a, a, a unifier, is that all humanity has a real desire to connect to, 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 to family. Um, yeah, do you feel it's important for other, do you feel that it's important for people to, to know about the, the, new, the cultural nuances of Serbia or, or Mexico or Sweden or Puerto Rico or, um, you know, Venezuela or Tampa? <laughs> Is it important to spread that knowledge? Go ahead. You want me to go first again? Okay. Yeah, Zach. Lucky me. Uh, first, uh, I will refer to a couple of your po points. Uh, number one, I do love the... The, the reference uh, that you use, Fred, uh, about tapestry. I also like to use the mosaic about, about the cultures here, about the, 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 the American experience here. I hate mm -hmm. the word melting pot because that means we are losing and we are completely shifting, changing into this amalgam of whatever. I like the tapestry where you're still keeping your color of your thread. I like the mosaic. You're still keeping your, your, your shine, your shape. You may get it a little bit of shaped out, out, but you fit in the bigger picture along with other cultures. And you can see how we all together actually can work together on something that's better and greater than that. And for me, that's part, and I will, I will go to, towards the family part, that is what the family instilled the values in me. And I believe that's why we all refer to because we get most of our basic values and foundations from the people that we grew up with, our family, our cousins, brothers, sisters, if we have them. And uh, then later on, we may learn something from our peers in school. And eventually we pass those to our kids, which are the meaning of life, really. And if we teach them right, then we pass those values. We, we should pass the best part of us so they can teach their kids and fit into a mosaic of whatever the world or society they, they, they live in. Mm. And to me, it is very important to also be proud of our heritage and love my heritage because we do have a lot of things to be proud of. And I do feel that technology has made it more available that Djokovic is, is Serbian, Tesla was Serbian. You know, we do have a lot of great minds that maybe some only nerds mainly knew that Tesla was Serbian. <laughs> you know? But now it's... Thanks, Elon Musk, and his uh, <laughs> he actually, uh, put the name more forward. But also, it is 
it is also important for me not just to love my own, but to respect everybody else. And I believe that is part of the family values that families should instill in their kids. And we do have a saying back and back in Formula Islamic, it's like, love your own, but respect everybody else. You know, so you, you feel free to love your heritage, feel free to be proud of it, but don't be too obnoxious and still make sure that you are aware of somebody else, your neighbor that lives across the, across the street or next house and respect him as well and try to learn from him as well. So that is my response to that. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's so important, especially now, you know, for other organizations to give support and access to ethnic and multi-ethnic, you know, representation and fully understand, you know, the weightedness in having diversity and allowing others to embrace their ancestry and, you know, why that sense of belonging is so important, so necessary. And so having conversations like this is, you know, not only the start, but it's it's just in the beginning. Um, I, that's my input on that. <laughs> your last question. Yeah. But I'll agree with you because in a sense, the more we educate each other of who we are, then we're truly valuing each human being, right? Mm-hmm. So then we're able to come to the table and we're able to see what could we bring that somebody else might not bring. And in regards to technology, I think it gives us a better access, but I personally feel that I'm rooted into my Hispanic heritage, even if I was only there for 10 years, but there's a root there and and it's important to be able to keep that into my new country, right? So, yeah. I'm gonna jump in because Zach inspired me with his nerd comment. (laughs) I'm a huge language nerd, and I noticed that most of you mentioned language when you were um, talking about how you keep connected. And even though I learned to speak Spanish as a second language, I have found that there are certain words that exist in Spanish that I can't find the right translation for in English. And they're just such great words. They're so necessary. My favorite one is pendiente. And pendiente is when you're kind of in a state of awareness so that you can be ready to react to something or act on it when it happens. And there is no economical way to say that in English. And so I just wanted to ask the panel, um, what's your favorite word or phrase in your home language that you find that you can't live without because English just doesn't have a great translation? In Swedish, we have many words that you just cannot translate. There aren't enough words in, under the sun for it. Um, we have one which so, sort of describes the Swedish nature, the nature of the Swedish people. And it's lagom, which means that just right. And, you know, if you say, how are, th- are things, how, are you, do you have enough of something? It's lagom. But it's also it describes your whole life. You, you're afraid to, to go overboard or, or, or in any aspect because you have want to be right. You do not want to be exaggerating anything. And another thing in Swedish <laughs> is that you're not supposed to be in Sweden. You're not supposed to think you're better than anybody else. And they actually have a law, which is called Jante law, which means something, I'm not any better than you. So those are some Swedish things that you can't even translate and can't even compare to anything else in any other country that I can think of. That's great. So mine might be a little um, less sophisticated than that. Um, but in my household, we say, mira. A lot. <laughs> and uh, my husband's American and, and he also says, mira. Um, and it literally means look, but it's, it can mean a lot of different things depending on the context of what you're trying to say. Um, we also say oite, meaning like, did you hear me? Did you hear what I was saying? Um, and they're just little words that have worked their way into the, the fabric, the tapestry of, uh, uh, of my you know, mixed culture household that my husband and I have started. Um, and those words always kind of uh, pop up and bubble up in my house. Jennifer? 
Mine is similar to yours, as I always say, nombre. But obviously, if everybody has gone through Spanish one, you would think that nombre would be your name. But in Mexico or just in anywhere, you're like, nombre. It's like, no way. Tell me more. <laughs> so just even I remember working in different spaces, and every time I'd walk by, people would be like, nombre, because it's just an exciting word of like, you got to be kidding me that this is happening until you get somebody that they're like, is that your name? I'm like, no, it's no way. So if nombre would be one, and I love anodadada, which is speechless, but that word just sounds so rich in Spanish, like, estoy anodadada, but yes, but nombre would be mine. That's great. And Zach? Ones that pop up are the bad words, the curse words, but we won't share those. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's good. We all can, sh- you know, have a very rich dictionary of those, uh, because you're all passionate cultures. So, but honestly, I, I thank you all for trying to give me time to come up with a with a good one word answer. But really, uh, some of my, my my Serbian friends would say uh, the word is Serbsky when they start mixing English and Serbian. I do, I'm the person that tries to correct them and say either do one sentence of this or the one sentence of that. So I uh, may be annoyed. But no, uh, honestly, w- with us, we seem to have a saying for every possible situation. And um, we have hundreds of these sayings that I love seeing Google attempt to translate on Facebook or, <laughs> or different social media because they mean absolutely nothing that they're actually meant to be. So really, it all depends on the situation. I will have a favorite saying that I will say right then and there. So I apologize for not picking uh, one word that's that's really my favorite. Uh, pride, maybe, which means ponos. Uh, and we're very prideful in that way, which sometimes it, it's a negative thing, but, you know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Sorry. Cool. I go, Shana. Did you want to say something? Oh, well. I mean, I know it means other things in, in other languages, but I, I would say the word, um, you know, inquisitive to me, um, because ever since I was little, I, you know, I was told I was a inquisitive child, but you know, it was always to question, question everything, and um, you know. In my background now in marketing, I question everything. And, um, you know, you know, I'll question, you know, why is it that you need, you know, this representation? Is it to fill a quota or is it, you know, because you're actually waking up? And I'm always the one with those, with the questions. And so um, that word, you know, in other languages means different things, um, you know, but to me, it's just uh, with everything that's been going on, it's forcing people and organizations to look at, you know, why they grant or deny access to certain people of certain backgrounds and being more inquisitive, finding out, you know, how that makes people feel and, you know, why it's so important for inclusion. That's great. That's great. I think you all have, oh, I'm sorry. sorry But Sheena actually inspired me. There is a word that explains a lot of, uh, in a way, our, uh, our, our mentality and outlook of, on life because Balkans has been an area where a lot of empires crossed and things like that. And really part of my culture, it is a, it is a one word that, that can describe a lot of, a lot of people there. It's uh, inat or prkos. Uh, the two words kind of mean the same thing. And really the, the Google will translate it to spite but it's more of that. It's spite and stubborn pride and everything in one. And I believe that is one word where the reverse psychology would work on a lot of us because we will do a lot of things just in spite somebody tells us not to. And as, as my parents will tell you, I probably am, you know, I have a lot of that. So nah. as a sport rat. <laughs> I think we've, you know, I I had kind of a second major question, and I think that in many ways it's been answered, but I'll ask it again because I think it's kind of a important way of summing up a bit. And that is, you know, why is it important to keep up your cultural ties? And and I'll kind of add to that. Why is it important to keep up your cultural ties and how, how can it really serve us all that you're committed to do that? Why is it important? 
I'll go first because it's our identity, right? It's our value of who we are as an individual to be able to come and share with people our own um, our own stories and where we come from. But it truly is who you are. So, and everybody's different. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. I would, you? you know, I feel great pride about where I'm from. You know, my little island of 100 miles by 30 miles has produced some great humans that have made some amazing contributions to this world. And not just Jennifer Lopez, but many other people. Uh, <laughs> so I think um, for me, I just feel immense pride in where I'm from and who I am and and who my, my family and my ancestors were. And I have a son now who's two and a half. Um, He'll probably never live a day in his life on the island, um, but I still want him to feel deeply connected to, to that part of him. So I have a real tangible legacy that I, I feel connected to in him and a real responsibility with him. That's beautiful, great. Zach? It is important, of course, to keep, keep in touch with our culture because we do have so many, all of us have so many, so many things. And I will say Perico, you used to have great basketball players and always tough teams. So, you know, I love <laughs> basketball. Uh, but it is important to, to be proud of what we have and also use that as a way to learn about other cultures, to see what our similarities are, uh, to see, you know, similarities in music, similarities in writing, similarities in poems. Or differences, and then try to enrich your culture by learning something from from the others, and see. See, really, to me, it's important to be to be in touch with my culture and be proud of my culture, so I can share with everybody else what I love, uh, because that is part of me. And if somebody wants to be my friend, they will listen for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> Some of our writers and history and, and, and things like, that. but I also do want to listen to others too. Um, I love my Pandora, uh, the, the music service, because the, it actually allows me to listen to everything else. I mean, I was just say, uh, I'm for, I was not born just uh, or, or taught just my culture. My father, some of his favorite musicians, one of his favorite musicians I have to mention was Fela Kuti, uh, who's from Nigeria. Okay. So he really instilled in me the value of that music and, and and learning about other cultures, but also respecting your own. And uh, I do like prefer to, I, I, I will try to stay in touch with my culture and learn as much as I can. But really, I'm more, I'm really attracted to ideas like Spiff's and Dali and all the museums around here and the cultural events and Stras that actually try to expand our knowledge where we are not just in this bubble. And for me, really, Tampa Bay Area is perfect for that. So I feel grateful for that. That's great. That's great. Lota? Well, I can only agree with what uh, Zach just said. And also, we're talking about, you were talking about um, uh, Puerto Rico and some, whatever, was it baseball or whatever? Uh, we have in Sweden, have, have one of our absolutely best uh, soccer players is from Serbia, Slatan. Yeah. Bosnia, I will correct you. Sorry, okay. Yes. Well, we, <laughs> no. they, call it, they call him Serb, you know, so. Um, yeah, yeah. But he's, he's bo bo was born in former Yugoslavia, so there you go. You cannot just put somebody to one geographic region. You're right. That's right. That's right. And another thing, you know, when you're talking about that, we have all the people migrating all over Europe, all over the world. And that's another thing where it's so important that we share our culture with them, our values, and try to understand them. We have lots and lots of immigrants in Sweden, for instance, and uh, uh, they do have an opportunity to learn Swedish really quickly, but it's very hard um, because usually what happens with immigrants, you probably all know that, they stay together and they do not really get assimilated into the community as quickly as they probably would uh, be better off doing. And this is why we have the, the I would say we have a little bit of uh, 
superstition about other people from other countries because, number one, they don't understand what we're talking about. We don't understand what they are talking about. They look different. We have to just understand we have to try to talk to each other. We have to get to know each other no matter who we are. Oh, that's great. Yeah, no, that's great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in just because your question just really inspired me, even though I'm sitting here as somebody who was born and raised um, in the United States, and I feel very distant from my own, you know, cultural heritage of Scotland and Ireland. Um, but as the mother of three Venezuelan American children, I will say that it was very important to me that they be in touch with their heritage. So mm -hmm. important that I really took a professional step backwards um, to leave the United States and move to Venezuela for um, almost a decade because I felt that for them to live in Venezuela and to experience um, the culture in full immersion with language, with customs, was not only important for them to understand themselves as Venezuelans, but I think it was important for them to see that no matter what culture you come from, it's very dangerous to see yourself in any way as the norm. And mm -hmm. for them to be able to really critically think and compare US and Venezuelan culture and think for themselves about what kinds of things they view as positive and what kinds of things they view as negative in each one, instead of just accepting things as, well, that's the way they are. And for me, that was really, really important for them. Um, there's like a deeper, a deeper level there than just learning Spanish or, you know, learning how to make a yakas for Christmas. You know, it was about seeing that, you know, just because you live in the United States, that doesn't mean that everything we do is normal or right. People mm. do very differently in other places for very good reasons often. So and this wow. is why we need to celebrate diversity. Mm -hmm. No matter where we are. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Jenny, go ahead. No, 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 you go, go, go. <laughs> it also highlights the need for, you know, not only being aware of the diversity in your own community, but, you know, if you're blessed to be able to travel and to, you know, experience different cultures outside of the U.S. I know right now we're in COVID times, which makes everything much more complicated, but um, I'm so grateful to my parents for, you know, allowing me to travel and see different places in the world. Um, and that really opened my eyes that, you know, there's so much more than just American or Puerto Rican culture. There's, uh, you know, a richness to the world and uh, they're not wrong because they do something different. Um, it's exciting to learn about new things. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I think it's, vital that you know we connect with our culture with other cultures because it just feeds our spirit um, and it connects us and you know for example through art you know it has no boundaries um and through this technologically driven world you know we're so disconnected and um you know it can help make that connection you know it can help people feel needed and, you know worthy and um, you know, and helps people decipher, you know, who they are and, and what they stand for. So, um, very, very important to connect with not only your own culture. It makes us more open-minded and it also creates um, empathy, right? Because yeah. the words that Kim just described her children, that's an experience that I had thanks to my mother saying you need to see both worlds, right? Because then all of a sudden you realize what is it like to be an immigrant? What is it like to grow up within your native country? But to me, it just become it, we become more open minded to other cultures, other people, and it creates empathy, which is what we need right now. I really like what Denise said. <clears throat> just because you don't understand somebody, they're not wrong. Just you don't understand them. And I know that this is one reason we don't get along. You go to another country, you say, oh, my God, that's totally wrong. Can't do it that way. It's just part of their tradition. Understand why they're doing certain things. I mean, I travel all over the world, so I, I am guilty of some of those things myself. When I first moved to Hong Kong, I, you know, if I could do that over, I would not have been acting the same way I did then. But then, I, you know, 
you don't think something is so different, so strange, this can't be right. But it's not wrong just because it's different. And there's a lot of innocence in that too. I will tell you a short story. Um, when I first went to Italy, when I was in the service, uh, I was uh, I was walking down the street, uh, down this little Italian alleyway, uh, and uh, you know, just kind of walking along, and uh, and a, a guy came out his door, and he stepped out onto the step, and he started, you know, he was calling his dog, and he was speaking to his dog, and and his dog was like going back and forth, his dog was running, and he'd run, he'd run, and he'd play with him, and he and he ran into the house, and I. If I, I was I was 18 years old. I was like, man, that dog understands Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was so conditioned. Like, how do you do that? You know, I mean, so sometimes it's just the innocence of not knowing because things seem, you know, I first time I'd ever been out of the country. I was in everything was new and unique to me. But I just found it amazing that this little dog understood Italian. So I mean, you know, it's the innocence of what we don't know. Oftentimes, that you know, that really. Uh, Kim, I'll give it back to you to, to disclose. All right, Laura, did you have something to add? Yeah, two things. Uh, I knew somebody in Wisconsin who left on a trip to Italy came back to tell wonderful stories. But the most interesting one to me was that she was telling me that they got lost in the Italian part of town. <laughs> and I have another one, which probably tops all of it. Uh, mm -hmm. When I first arrived in this country, I was at a party. A young man, about my age, he was following me around. He was so interested in me and I couldn't figure out why. He said, at the end, he said, I have never met an alien before. <laughs> so this is what we have to understand each other, talk to each other. Absolutely, absolutely. I also think I would like to add: it is also important to 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 be able to see problem-solving skills from different cultures' perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we are raised with one way to look at a problem, and and. It is important for organizations, for, for companies, for firms to be very diverse as well, because different cultures, you just start seeing even basic multiplication and divisions from a different perspective. So it is important to for teamwork to be able to have somebody else's perspective as from where they were raised, because they will be able to solve a problem in a completely new way than, than you might be looking at, because you were just looking at it from your own perspective. Fantastic, yeah, yeah. We talked a lot about then the kind of the what, so what are the ways that we keep in touch with our culture and, and thinking about the why, the why it's important. And I wonder, since we're talking about all of these benefits of being immersed in various cultures, um, especially ideas about empathy and understanding and building a sense of, shared community and humanity. Maybe we could end with um, having people maybe think a little bit about the how. So if people wanna go forward, maybe after listening to this conversation and think about how might I learn more about other cultures? How might I connect with people um, who come from different backgrounds um, than mine? What would be your suggestions about how people might you know, dip their toe into the waters of, you know, thinking about and meeting and becoming immersed in other cultures. Welcome. Um, you know, we all miss getting together and performing and witnessing things live and sharing experiences. And, you know, during this time um, at home and with everything that's going on, you know, Many of us have found the importance of taking the time to learn and do some internal searching. You know, and with that, I would encourage people to reach out to, you know, friends, family, colleagues and ask, you know, do you have a favorite blog, podcast, book, film, um, you know, that you've turned to during this time to help, you know, with what's going on externally that you might want to share with me? Um, because... You know, sometimes you have that tunnel vision and you're just, um, it's really hard now if you don't do the asking and ask those questions, be inquisitive. Um, 
but uh, you know, ask other people, what are you reading? You know, and then from there, of course, decipher whether it's something that you'd want to, you know, um, take a dive into, but, um, you know, you'll be surprised at what other people, the resources that other people have access to that they can share with you. Um, and I think that especially now, you know, we can't get together in person. That's a way, um, to do that. Okay, I'll go. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Fred. No problem. No, I was just going to say, I think one of the most important things that we can be is curious about each other. is to not be fearful, but just to be curious. Um, you know, to, to taste other kinds of food and listen to other kinds of music. And, and you know, as Sheena said, you know, get recommendations or, or find a book or, you know, just find, find a, an ancient story. Um, there's so there's so much out there for us to learn about, and if we can, and I feel that we are um, really kind of ambassadors for encouraging people to go, you know, when the opportunity presents itself to go to the museum and, and look at a painting and and learn about it and and learn about the individual who created that piece of that that painting, you know, uh, to just really be curious. There's so much to be curious about. There's so much to learn and know. I can't tell you the times that I've listened to music from around the world and couldn't understand a single word, but it brought me to tears, you know, because there was a, there was a measure of commonality in the texture of what I was hearing that allowed me to feel, to go deeper within myself. So curiosity is a really, really, really wonderful way to really kind of let go and of that fear of the unknown and open up to the window of possibility. You, you opened up a great um, message in regards of just getting to know each other. Right now with COVID, we're all, we can't network, we can't go out and just, you know, uh, superficially get to know people, but this is a great opportunity to actually go to our colleagues that we see every day or just pick up the phone and just ask people, you know, blogs, but, you know, let me know about your family or just a simple question, how are you, and then take it from there. But this is our opportunity to be inquisitive and to reach out and to really get to know um, our fellow people that we see every day that we really, really don't know that much about. Just even ask them who their favorite uh, musician is, and then we'll open up a conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah uh, Jenny and I are coworkers, and it's been so nice to have this conversation. <laughs> We've gotten to know each other so I much. I know. <laughs> That's great. Great. Yeah, I would. I I think that maybe sometimes we should take a note, as we often think that as we become adults, we know more, and I think sometimes as adults we know less. And <laughs> I think we could really take a note from kids, and uh, you know, show and tell is something that's really easy. Or bringing in something to share. I don't know how many times when I was in uh, grade school that we would have a fair or a day in language class where every person could bring in something um, that, you know, was a family tradition um, that they did. And I know I'm lucky to be a colleague of Denise. And so every Christmas season, I get to benefit from being the recipient of her amazing coquito recipe. And <laughs> That's a really wonderful way uh, that she has shared a small part of her culture um, with me, but it's taught me something um, interesting about the way that Christmas is celebrated and the things that people enjoy drinking and um, the ways that they enjoy sharing. I agree with, uh, with all the points and really with Fred, especially about curiosity. We are lucky enough to have access to all the different media to access information about other cultures. Unfortunately, we are also unlucky because there's so much junk out there. So please don't stop at Wikipedia. Uh, really, the best way to, to learn somebody's culture is, of course, recipes, cooking, you know, music, uh, poetry. I think that is a really, really good way to, to if you can find them translated to English. Travel, of course, is the best way. But, you know, in these days, you have to travel uh, via YouTube or, or Google. And I really, I'm very grateful that Dali organized this because it is important for cultural institutions, uh, reputable cultural institutions to 
carry the torch of this cultural education about you know one or two cultures and, and because you are respected you are not a junk source of information you do your homework and you have really wonderful background and outreach that you can use to actually educate everybody else around us in this community and you know dali Straz, i think that those are very excellent outlets to educate people around about different in, in, in variety of cultures that, that exist around here and uh, i will just say one thing what's really interesting one thing that i picked up here through uh through through uh other cultures is uh Farolito by Juan Luis de Guerra, I'm horrible at pronouncing it, is this still the song that if I feel down in the morning, I need a waking up, that is the one I go to. <laughs> it's not even a Serbian song. But for some reason, as, as Fred says, you may not even understand this, the words, but the first time I heard it, I, that was one of the just a pick me up wonderful song that it's like, you know what, stuck in my head and made me research it more, get the translation and just see any of the other versions of it. So. Juan Luis Guerra is a great choice. I always, I always love his music. It just so, happens. He just happened to hear it from my from my friend who was from Saint Croix and Puerto Rico. She's uh, she's half and half, and uh, she played it for me, and it's like, wow, I'm sold. <laughs> He's one of the singers that I would listen to in the car with my mom. Yeah. Well, we're coming to the end of our hour together, and I just wanted to, um, before, I'm going to hand it over to Fred to um, kind of close this out, but I just wanted to make sure that we brought that front end kind of full circle here. Um, we talked at the beginning about identity and culture and, Hisper and Hispanic Heritage Month. And while I think this is a really great place to start this conversation, I really hope that this isn't where we end this conversation. Um, we should never relegate these conversations about culture and identity and diversity to just one month of the year. Um, and rather than being a one-off, I hope this is the start of a series of conversations um, that we can carry forward to explore this topic. And I just really appreciate all of you um, and everything that you've shared tonight. So I'm gonna hand it over to Fred and take us away, Fred. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kim, and to the Dali Museum um, for uh, having this vision and for allowing us to be a part of it. And I'm, I think I, everyone will agree with me, and I know that um, at SPIFS we are committed to every day um, doing what we can to really uphold that conversation and inspire people's curiosity and create opportunities for us to celebrate our community, to celebrate the richness of our community, to celebrate the importance of culture, to really, really recognize that it is the things that are different about us that make the human experience magnificent. Um, and so again, uh, on behalf of SPIFS, thank you. And thanks to all who, uh, uh, participated, great thought, lots of laughter, lots of lots of positive introspection, and I think that that's really what it's all about. I'm kind of known for music, so I'll dare to just take a moment and say, it's the simple things that we can do to make our world a better place, to look into another's eyes and realize that we're all part of a family. We may look different and even speak slightly different, but don't you know, we're all a part of the one. So on behalf of the Dali Museum and on behalf of Spiffs too, we thank you, stay safe, stay well. We'll see you next time. Do the greatness that you do. Stay curious. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you.